by his panellists, the first one of which is James Bridle, a multidisciplinary artist and journalist and obviously the best dressed person here. Again, Martin Ford, please be introduced to him, and the an author and futurist. Then we have Daniel Hume, who's a director of business analytics, uh, University College of London, and the CEO of Satalia. We also have Ashken Karazayan, Director of Civil Liberties and Legal Research Fellow, the Tech Freedom. <laughs> Followed by Christopher Markow, uh, an early career affiliated lecturer of Jesus College, the University of Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, Narian Murti, the founder and chairman emeritus of Infosys. Over to you, Richard. The rise of the machines. <laughs> I do not know why you're all applauding. Some people on the panel may suggest that it's going to be the Armageddon of machines. But I do know that we have in this room the various people who all absolutely know this subject, upside down, back to front. And they're going to challenge each other, and they're going to discuss exactly what we are looking at when we think of AI, robotics. Remember what we were told, the promise versus the peril, ladies and gentlemen. The promise versus the peril. Which is it going to be? Before we get to start, though, we need an introduction, we need to set the stage. And for that, to ask Mr. Murty, the founder and chairman emeritus of Infosys, who will then give a keynote speech that will help set the agenda for what we're about to discuss. Sir. Desktops, laptops, 
tablets and mobile phones to applications for customers, employees, vendor partners, and other stakeholders using internet as a medium while ensuring performance, reliability, and security for traversing the net to connect users with their applications. Automation is an extended form of sometimes self-learning, computerization, which relies on the premise that any process that can be represented by a deterministic and sometimes by a stochastic finite state machine is best handled by a computer program rather than a human being. It ranges from automated business processes to self-driven cars to computer-driven steel making to remote surgery. While many large companies are using rudimentary automation tools for business processes, some smart startups have built robust, secure, scalable, and intelligent platforms that enable a very high level of automation for business processes. IoT or Internet of Things is an extended form of remote and distributed real-time process control using internet as the medium to control appliances, machines, and processes using digital analog converters, analog to digital converters, and transducers. It is IoT, robotics, and AI that make possible driverless cars, robotic surgery, robot control of factories, operation of nuclear power plants by robots, and programming and remote operation of appliances. What is machine learning? Machine learning is about classifying information into groups. This ability is based on pattern recognition. Pattern recognition stems from the ability to fit patterns or curves to a set of data and classify them as belonging to a separate set of data with some unique characteristics. Machine learning algorithms are very advanced and they are complex curve-fitting programs that use many hundreds and sometimes even thousands of variables and classify input data into distinct groups with unique characteristics. Machine learning algorithms are of two kinds. The first kind is what's called a supervised algorithm. Since humans supply such algorithms with all the data and rules that are needed, unsupervised algorithms have to infer some new data and some new rules from the data supplied and based on some complex rules of mathematics. Let me give you an example of a machine learning algorithm. You want to enhance the probability of success of drilling an oil well. In the past, you had drilled 100 oil wells and found oil in just 20 of them. You would use the plethora of information, that is the data items relating to the success or otherwise of drilling, that you obtained from drilling these 100 wells to train a machine learning algorithm for drilling so that the algorithm would unearth correlations amongst the data items relating to success or otherwise of drilling. At this point of time, machine learning algorithm is likely to be more learned and can hopefully better predict finding oil in a given location than before. This is the same type of principle used by an expert system to diagnose a disease or by Netflix to recommend a movie to you or even by Amazon to recommend a book to you. Let me now come to the question of whether these technologies are a panacea or a dystopian nightmare. There are multiple reasons why people fear them as a dystopian nightmare. I'm convinced that it is more a boom than a nightmare. Let me give some arguments. Science is about unraveling nature, while engineering is about science, using science to make life more comfortable for human beings. Without the knowledge of quantum behavior of atoms discovered by Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrodinger, and others, 
engineers could not have invented transistors, lasers, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, electron microscopy and DVDs. Without the theory of relativity enunciated by Albert Einstein, engineers would not have provided the world nuclear energy, accurate global positioning systems and FET scanners which used the famous Einsteinian equation of e equal to mc square. Without the work of Kurt Gödel, Alan Zucher, Alan Turing, and John von Neumann, we would not have had computers that are so ubiquitous and so critical to our existence today. Without the celebrated theories of James Maxwell and Claude Shannon, the world would be a dark and disconnected place today. Therefore, without exception, at least in my opinion, technology has made life more comfortable for human beings as long as they are put to good use. Technology reduces cycle time, improves productivity, and reduces cost. Who needs it more than the poor? Whether it is a CEO or a janitor of a company, the ATM machine provides the same level of service unlike at a bank counter manned by a human being. Therefore, technology, in my opinion, is a great leveler. Technology reduces costs, makes gadgets, and provides tools and access to information easily, speedily, and inexpensively available to the poorest citizens. Look at the role that social media played in Arab Spring and other various social transformation initiative. Therefore, it is fair to say that technology has the potential to be a great democratizer. Let me give some more examples of how AI, machine learning, and big data help the world today and are likely to help the world in the future. I will use the book What to Do When Machines Do Everything by Malcolm Frank, Paul Grory, and Ben Green. A study by a US, U.S. university estimates that automated vehicles will likely result in 3.2 crashes per million miles as against 4.2 crashes per million miles for the human-driven vehicles. It is believed that 94% of these accidents is due to human error and result in a cost of over $1 trillion to that society. The interpretation of risk X-rays using automation has improved in U.S. hospitals by a factor of 30 with a 99% accuracy, thus eliminating unnecessary biopsies. More than 12 million mistakes in U.S. in the form of medical diagnosis are estimated to contribute to 400,000 deaths each year. Big data with machine learning and deep learning algorithms have the potential to drastically reduce these kinds of deaths. Look at how painless, quick, inexpensive, and easy laser surgery has become. Betterment, a robo-investment advisory firm, provides an AA-based investment advisory to Henry's protocol, high earners, not rich yet fellows who cannot invest more than US dollar 1 million, which is the lower limit for accepting customers by most bulge bracket firms. IoT is likely to have a huge impact in the coming years. According to McKinsey, IoT device sales and services would reach $11 trillion by 2025. 90% of the cost will be online, not driverless, but online by 2020 from just 2% 2 in 2012. The shipment of variable, variables, which most of us are wearing here today, is likely to go from 76 million in 2015 to about 173 million by the end of this year. Most of these are what I would term assistive uses of AI, big data, and machine learning. They help human beings become more productive and reduce the cost of these services. What is the solution? Should we paint a doomsday scenario and sit waiting or do something to ride this technological wave? I would say we should do the latter. 
Sure, there will be job losses whenever a new technology comes into picture. Just as it happened when cars took over from horse carriage, rendering the horse carriage drivers unemployed. The automatic telephone exchanges led to mass unemployment of manual exchange operators, but it led to huge productivity improvement for people at law. Oxford University predicts that 47% of U.S. jobs will be automated by 2025. That is about 75 million jobs. Probably it's somewhat of an exaggeration, exaggeration, at least in my view. A consensus estimate would be about 10% or about 16 million jobs. There is also an estimate that about 20 million jobs will be created due to the fourth industrial revolution, which I talked about earlier. Therefore, the general belief is that there is no cause for worry on the job front through the kind, though the kinds of jobs that are be created will move from mundane jobs to high-tech, high-tough jobs requiring human skills. The theoretical basis for such job annihilation and creation is given by Professor Carlota Perez, a professor of economics at LSE. She has pointed out that every new technology stalls the GDP contribution by the technology to the GDP, of course, for 20 to 30 years, followed by a near vertical takeoff in its contribution to GDP and job in the next 30 to 40 years. And then finally, this job growth starts waning. The moral of the story is re-education and retraining so that we human beings from jobs, jobs of drudgery to one of human touch and make life better for the employees and for customers. Therefore, I believe that we should welcome these assistive technologies and combat job losses through retraining and re-education and through expanding the job market that requires human touch. But transforming every change requires determination, hard work, discipline and commitment. Without these attributes, no nation can leverage new technologies, make the life of people who lose jobs bearable, and the life of smart, young, and confident job seekers better. Thank you. I think we've made up an excellent summation of the situation with a conclusion uh, to it. So as we start our discussion here, um, I, I'm curious, let's go down the line, if we may. James, which side, versus the, the apocalypse, the, the, the promise versus the peril, which side are you on so we know how to judge and to assess your contributions as we proceed? Um, I consider myself to be a, um, a, a hopeful optimist about many things, but critical of the ways in which many of these technologies are actually employed. And you um, bring your artist and journalist background to that? Yeah, I mean, I wrote a book called New Dark Age, which, as you can imagine, is not exactly about the cheery side of these technologies. Um, but like, for, for an example, let's, let's pull out something and respond to the, the keynote briefly. Um, I think, for example, one thing that I would say is I, I highly agree uh, with many of the points, but possibly take a different stance on them. So the argument, for example, that data is the new oil uh, is a wonderful phrase if you think that oil is a good thing. <laughs> right. Well, to these thoughts, I'm all right. Martin. Hang on, just uh, hopefully your mic is on already. Try again. Just try again. One, two, three, four. Mine is. How about this? Okay. Uh, I think that both sides uh, of this technology definitely exist. The positive is real and, and the disruption, the negative is real. Most of my work, my writing, has focused on the pessimistic side and, and most of it's focused on the impact on the job market. And my message really is that we have to be honest and open-minded about the dark side of this technology to make sure that we do have the optimistic outcome. We're good. All these, all these things. Um, just make sure these mics are on, since we don't have to be spending the next 20 One, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. 
I would say I'm definitely an optimist, and not only that, I believe that we either innovate or we die. We gotta move forward, and we always gotta believe in the future. But you're an optimist that wants to move forward. Is that right? Yes, I'm an optimist about the promise of AI. Yeah, but we're all optimistic about the promise. Yes, absolutely. And all of that stuff we'll figure out on the way. <laughs> all right. Hello. There we go. So I think the keynote was right. For the next 10 years, we're going to see a lot of growth. Like, we actually had a lot of growth of horses when cars came along, but horses declined by 90% over a 50-year period, and uh, they, they didn't have jobs. They became dog food. And my concern is that, that we are actually, actually heading towards a dystopian future, but I think that decentralization could solve it. This one. Um, I'm a skeptical optimist uh, about all of this. The, the motto of science, as I once understood it, was nullus in verbo, nobody's word, and that meant that you were supposed to question and attempt to falsify. Um, and I see that, I think one of the biggest problems in this conversation is that the, the raw optimism that people have about AI and other technologies is bordering on transcendental, almost, and to countenance that, I think it's really important to ask hard questions, like James does, uh, Eric does in his book, um, because every technological paradigm, from the railroad to telephones, it's created winners and losers, and this one won't be different. Okay, so, if we accept, as our starting point, there's going to be, that, that there's really no difference other than perhaps size and scale, um, Martin, what is your fundamental fear as we move forward? And then divide our discussion, by the way, into jobs and economics, and privacy, um, and uh, if you like, human rights issues, and then judgment and morality and ethics. Uh, but before we do, we do need to sort out these microphones so that we're not all um, <laughs> trying to use one microphone. Have you got a microphone? Take your microphone back. Just let's see if yours works. Put all the microphones up at the same time. Please rise and raise the level on all the microphones at the same time. It's, this one works. I'll do all the talk. <laughs> this one works. This, this one works. Right, it's about three now, so stop being greedy. Oh, I'll have you in a minute. <laughs> This works okay. Uh, so my, the, the primary thing that I have focused on, my primary concern is that as artificial intelligence and machine learning and robotics advance, a huge fraction of the jobs and tasks currently performed in the economy are going to be susceptible to automation. Primarily, it's going to be those types of roles that are fundamentally routine, repetitive, and to some extent predictable. And that could be jobs in factories, but it could also be white collar jobs, the kind of job where you're sitting in front of a computer doing something relatively routine, perhaps producing the same report again and again. And that's a very large percentage of jobs. In most countries, it's probably something on the order of half the jobs in the economy. But where do you stand, where do you stand um, on, on Mr. Murphy's point between the, the sort of the lower levels of job losses and the higher levels? Right, it's absolutely true that as these jobs are impacted and lost, more jobs will be created. But the question is, will there be enough of those new jobs? Remember, we're talking about up to half the jobs in the economy. And the second point is, will the nature of those new jobs be such that a lot of the people that lose more routine work are going to have a great deal of difficulty transitioning into those new roles? Those new roles might, might require lots of education or they might require talents like creativity or, or perhaps really sophisticated people skills. Not everyone you know, has those capabilities and can easily acquire them. So I, I do think there's potentially a big challenge that is coming at us within the next decade or two. Uh, we need to have our eyes open about that. We need to think about what we're gonna do to meet that challenge. So um, I, I think one of my favorite quotes by Canadian scholar Marshall McLuhan is that there, there's no inevitability except to contemplate what is happening. And when I hear people talk about the future of work, um, it becomes very deterministic. Uh, the study that was cited in the keynote by Frey and Osborne from uh, Oxford Martin School 
um, is one of many studies that, that forecast these futures as if we have no control over them. But, but if we get those numbers wrong, or we underprepare, we will be in a very serious situation. Well, so that's the role of law and policy. We can guarantee full employment, we can create jobs, we can control the pace of automation, we can do a lot of things to give people a fighting chance so that they're not automated out of dignity and having the right to work. Machines are rising, particular voices. Um, as the lawyer on this panel, uh, my favorite thing in my line of work is killing bad laws and bad ideas. And I think it's very problematic to try to regulate the future of work and AI in that space without even knowing what it's going to look like. In 1963, the cover of the Life magazine said that everything's going to be automated and everyone is going to be out of work. That still hasn't happened. Obviously, a lot of changes came along the way. And all the studies, obviously, can present both sides of the argument. But we will never know until we are in it. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh. <laughs> whoa. You want to be in the mess before you create a solution to it. No, we should think about the solutions, but we shouldn't legislate on them before knowing what situation we're in. But we do know. A, a technological, yeah, but we do know that a technological revolution is underway, one that will have profound uh, effects on... Right, but, so first of all, you can't regulate every single AI industry, right? They're very different, let's say, truckers versus use of AI in hiring. No, no, but kind of, uh, my company builds AI solutions that exactly. can affect people's jobs, and so we're at the forefront of this. And uh, as long as we are continuing to try to sell more stuff to people and squeeze more out of our operations and reduce labor to increase profits, we're going to continue to remove tasks, and at some point we will be remo removing whole jobs. So it's predicted in the next 10, 15 years, we will be removing whole jobs, and people won't be able to retrain, I disagree, people won't be able to retrain fast enough to get new jobs, and this, our economies are not set up for it. I don't think legislation will work. I think the well, companies can move just, much more quickly. I, to just, to just let's dissect what you've said. That we won't be able to retrain, and there won't be the jobs available, or the people will not be able to... Uh, no, that's what you just said, correct? Because AIs can take those future jobs. Right. That will have a societal effect, correct? Mm -hmm. How prepared are we for that? Yes. I mean, it depends on the country, obviously. It depends on the legal system, on the rule of law in the country, on the economy and how it's built. Uh, I think as a world, like the international economy, the world economy is definitely not as prepared as it should be. And that's why forums like this should bring us all together to figure out um, the solutions and the plan when things start happening. I'm, I'm sort of astonished at the idea that we can't legislate around this stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm no particular fan of legislation, but legislation is essentially what's protected the vast majority of people from the predations of industry and corporations for the last century. Uh, the idea that this is some kind of fourth industrial revolution is frankly terrifying to me. Uh, the only thing that stopped uh, has, has prevented unfettered industrial revolution from destroying the planet thus far is some level of legislation of protection around us. And particularly, tech companies know this, right? Google and Facebook and other companies are the largest donors uh, to US politics at present. They, they, do the, they put, put the most money into presidential candidates in order to prevent legislation, because they know that legislation would affect their businesses in a serious way. And so when we hear that, uh, that like, legislation can't keep up with this, that's just saying that we're not smart enough to think about this. We all are. The kind of uh, things that we've seen happening, particularly in Europe, around uh, whether there has been legislation, meaningful legislation around this. Again, I'm no fan of GDPR, but it is an effective ma uh, attempt at effectively managing data. Uh, the right to be forgotten is a really important, powerful piece of legislation. Uh, countries have stepped in in the last just couple of weeks. France and Germany have said they're not going to permit Facebook to create an extra national legal currency. Uh, that's, that's states acting on behalf of their citizens to oppose the unfettered uh, rule of these companies. David, on, on this, this question of what you... I was most taken by what you said and what, what James just said, in the sense that it's 
society is going to have to deal with this. Are we not better off preparing now? The people in this room who are the experts in their companies, the people like you, prepare now rather than wait in 20 years time, 15 years time, to have a disenfranchised, um, truculent, riotous public. I think that as long as, I'm going to be a bit bold here, as long as we have countries with the objective function of fighting for GDP, as long as we have companies wanting to make profits, we are not going to solve the problem. And I actually have a 30-year plan to remove the concept of companies, and I hopefully eventually remove the concept of countries, and I think decentralization is an enabler of our future world. Is that realistic? Yes. 